All right, this is the time where I say good morning. Technically, it's not even morning and it's not even Sunday morning. Uh, as you probably noticed, if you're on the YouTube site, this is gonna be uploaded a few days later. This is actually Wednesday afternoon I am recording this sermon. Uh, the reason I'm recording it now is because we did record our church service on Sunday. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to unload it onto my computer because of technical issues. So I am redoing the sermon today just for you on YouTube. Um, part of the reason why I'm doing this is just continuity, but also because today's sermon is pretty integral in our series through 1 Kings, especially coming into next week's uh, sermon. You'll definitely know some of the stuff that we talk about today. So I apologize that this wasn't out on Sunday afternoon like I usually do. Just talk, chalk it down to technological issues. So. With that little preface, let's get started. So let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, we have to dive into your word. Lord, I just pray. Lord, you open our hearts, open our minds. And Lord, be my tongue as I present your word. In your name we pray. Amen. When I was back in Prince George about a month ago with Sierra to draw her off at Ness Lake Bible Camp and also to preach at Lakes Community Church, I stayed with my parents, as I often do when I go back to Prince George. While I was there, my dad, of course, is in full swing in haying season, so he gets up early in the morning and a lot of times comes back late at night. Even sometimes when we are there, he's just so busy we don't get to see him. So Saturday morning, I woke up a little early so I could spend some time with my dad. And as we're talking, he was mentioning to me, as the case happens with a lot of farmers, and farmers can relate to this, they had one piece of machinery here, one vehicle there, and they needed to do some rearranging. So they needed an extra driver to come and get a vehicle. They were gonna get his boss's wife to come and do it, but I volunteered. Partially so I could spend more time with my dad and his boss, because I actually worked for my dad's boss, uh, Mr. Parr. Gordon's a great guy. Um, but also because, you know, I just wanted to get out and about and the field that they had to go to, was the area where my grandparents used to live. So I, I love it out there. So I wanted an opportunity to go out there. So while we were driving out there, or maybe even the day before, my dad actually mentioned that my grandfather's old homestead, the family farm, was up for sale. It's been out of the family now for, oh geez, over 30 years. And it's had a few different owners for the year. And the current owners are now selling it. And you know, we went out there, I thought, you know, I really want to see that, right? I want to see if it's for sale and all that kind of stuff. So after dropping my dad and his boss off and I go jump in the vehicle, I asked my dad's boss, because it was his vehicle, if you mind if I took a quick errand out there just to see, because my grandfather's homestead was only not even a kilometer away from the field we were actually at. He said, sure, no problem. So I drove up there to the, my grandfather's old farm and sure enough, it was for sale. And as a funny side note, the realtor agent, Bonnie Griffith, is actually someone I knew because I knew her mom and dad and had a great relationship with them when we were in Lakes. So I knew Bonnie, she was just a, a wee little girl and now she's all grown up and a big time real estate agent. So I, I saw that, took the picture, went back and later that day, I said, you know what? I'm gonna see how much it's for sale. And I knew it was gonna be high because the real estate market in Prince George is booming, just like it is in a lot of places. So I called her up, she told me the price, and I was, I was flabbergasted. It was way higher than I was expecting. And you know what, that kind of disappointed me. You know what, I was actually sad, I was disappointed, you know. I just was looking forward to it, right? Not that I was going to go and necessarily buy the family farm, but that took all, all thoughts of that away from me because it was, it's pretty high price. And you know what? I wanted, so badly wanted to get the family farm back in the family, right? Because it's where my grandfather, you know, him and his dad, they went, they took it from straight bush and they cleared it out and they made it into the property, made it into a productive farm, all this kind of stuff. I would great to see it back in the family's hands, right? Also for myself personally, I spent many years, many years out there at that farm, just so many great memories, you know, hanging with a family, playing off in the swamps, you know, Christmas, holidays out there, just so many good memories at that place that, like I said, I just really would like to own it. But like I said, when I found out the costs, I was really disappointed, you know, 
I was, I was sad because I wasn't able to get it. Now, in today's passage, which is 1 Kings chapter 21, we actually have a very similar story, at least at the beginning. The outcome, the end of the story is completely different than mine, but the beginning is very similar. Because chapter 21 opens with this line. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth at the Jezreel Lake. Now, when the Bible says incident, if we were to tell someone about that today, we would be incident. This was a major thing that happened. Naboth, to give us a little bit of context here, Naboth had a vineyard. And his vineyard, it was located in Jezreel, right beside or nearby King Ahab's summer palace. King, King Ahab went out, saw this beautiful vineyard, and he thought to himself, that would make, <clears throat> pardon me, that would make a wonderful vegetable garden. So he approached Naboth and he said, hey Naboth, will you send me, sell me that vineyard? Right? I'll, I'll give you I'll give you money for it, you know, the, the proper value, or I'll give you in exchange a vineyard somewhere else of the same, same value. He actually made a pretty good deal there. And unfortunately though, Naboth refused. Now, Naboth didn't refuse like some people today when someone asks them to buy their property because they're holding out for a better price. You know, if I say no, they'll come back and offer me more or whatever it is. And Naboth wasn't saying no because he was angry at the king and this was his political defiance or anything like that. Naboth refused to sell his land because he remembered scripture. He remembered in particular Numbers chapter 36, verse 7. No inheritance in Israel is passed from tribe to tribe, for every, every Israelite shall keep the tribal land inherited from his forefathers. What this meant was that the Israelites were not allowed to, allowed to sell their land. Land could be inherited, but never sold. It always had to stay within the family because that was God's grand plan for the Israelites. When they came in during the time of Moses and Joshua and conquered the land, the land was divided among them by families and it was always supposed to stay in your family. So Naboth realized he couldn't. He couldn't sell his land to King Ahab because Ahab wasn't from his family. He couldn't sell it to a different tribe. He couldn't sell it to a different family. So he refused so that he could keep it in his family and give it to his sons and so on and so forth, just as his forefathers had done. He was a God-fearing Israelite. Now, in response to this situation, in response to Naboth's answer, we're told that King Ahab goes home sullen and angry, kind of like I did, right? When I realized I couldn't buy my parent, grandparents' farm, I was sullen, I was disappointed. I may not have been angry, well, maybe a bit, you know, but I was disappointed, just like Ahab was. He really wanted to get this vineyard to turn into a vegetable garden for his palace, but he was unable to do that. Now, we kind of look at this and we say, oh, that's horrible, that's King Ahab. But just for a moment, just think about it. That's actually not the response that I would think of, especially if you study history and a lot of different things. What a king wants, a king gets. A king just simply says, give me your land. Or he could have just taken when Naboth said no. He could have had Naboth immediately executed for defying the king. He could have thrown him in prison. He could have charged him with treason. He could have done so many different things. But King Ahab actually respected Naboth in this situation. It shows that King Ahab, for all of his faults, for all of his flaws, maybe did have a little bit of moral scruples. You know, maybe he had a little bit of conscience. Maybe he had a little bit of good in him. However, his wife Jezebel had none of that. When Queen Jezebel came and saw King Ahab, you know, because we're told he was lying on a couch, sullen and angry in his bed, and she saw him like that, she said, what's going on? And he told her the story. And she said, leave it to me. I'll take care of it. You know, you're the king. You shouldn't behave like this. You shouldn't let people defy you, all that kind of stuff. And she promised to take care of it. And what she did was right away, Queen Jezebel got up, wrote a letter to the city elders, the rulers of that city, in the name of King Naboth, or sorry, the name of King Ahab, and said, Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them testify that he cursed God, both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. Upon receiving that letter, 
The elders did exactly what Queen Jezebel wanted. And Naboth, innocent Naboth, was stoned to death because of this. And they sent a letter back to Jezebel telling her that it was done. As soon as Jezebel gets that letter, she runs to King Ahab, tells him, go, you know, Naboth is dead, go and take that vineyard. And what does King Ahab do? Does he question it? Is he horrified? No, he simply gets up and he takes advantage of his wife's actions. And he goes down to start planning out his vegetable garden that was formerly Naboth's vineyard. Now at that time, we were told that King Ahab is down there starting to get ready to turn that vineyard into a vegetable garden. The word comes, the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. And he says, this is what God says in chapter 19. This is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where the dogs lick up Naboth's blood, the dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. So Elijah, the word of the Lord came to him. He knew he had to go tell this to King Ahab, so he gets up right away and he goes to King Ahab. When King Ahab sees Elijah coming to the vineyard, right away, King Ahab says to Elijah, So you have found me my enemy. King Ahab did not like Elijah. He knew he was in trouble. He knew he had done wrong, but he was defiant. In response to this, Elijah does, as we would call today, lays down the smack. He rebukes Ahab. He delivers God's message to him, and he says, I found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. I am going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Bashah, sorry, Bashah, son of Ajah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, Dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the open country. Now, after that pronouncement, that Elijah just comes in and he lays it down, God's judgment on King Ahab, the editor, the author of 1 Kings, takes a little aside. He steps outside of his narrative to give a little bit of context. He gives a comment about King Ahab's character. And he writes it in 1 Kings chapter 20, 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by his wife Jezebel. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols, like the Amorites the Lord had driven out before Israel. The author takes a brief moment to interrupt this narrative to just remind people what kind of man Ahab was. Ahab wasn't a normal guy who just made a bad decision. He wasn't a guy who struggled. Ahab was a man who willingly did evil in the eyes of the Lord and went after the idols, went after the balls and worshipped them instead of following God. He was not a good king. And he took advantage of his people or encouraged by his wife or allowed his wife to do things. I mean, as we talked about earlier, they had decimated the people who worshipped God. They had killed many of the prophets, torn down many of the shrines. They had done all of these things, and now God was calling judgment on them. You know, this incident with Naboth and the vineyard, in the grand scheme of things, and the whole thing of Ahab's life, was actually a small event. But it was an abuse of power, and it was, as we say today, the straw that broke the camel's back. And that was the end of Naboth's, sorry, not Naboth's, King Ahab's reign. God had finally had enough and decided to move King Ahab and Queen Jezebel from the scene. Now, after that little side is mentioned, the author goes right back into the narrative. And we're actually seeing here that when King Ahab is told this, when, like I said, Elijah lays a smack down and he realizes that King Ahab realizes he is going to die 
and all of his descendants are going to be wiped out, his house is going to be forgotten, what does he do? He actually humbles himself. And we see a change, and it comes in verse 27. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. In response to King Ahab's actions, God says to Elijah in verse 29, Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. So King Ahab actually, I wouldn't say repented, but he definitely humbled himself before the Lord and shown that he had done wrong. So God showed mercy on him and told him, no, I am not going to do all the things that I said. Or I'm going to do them, I'm just not going to do them. You're not going to see them or experience them. So he showed him a little bit of mercy. Like I said, the author did that little aside to give the, the judgment on Ahab's character just to make us realize that, yeah, okay, you know what, just because Ahab turned around here a little bit did not mean that he was a good king, did not mean he changed his ways, did not mean he worshipped God. Because, I mean, the whole story of King Ahab, you know, from Mount Carmel to what we looked at last week with the, the fight with Ben-Hadad, we see Ahab, King Ahab seems like he's going to worship the Lord, seems like he's going to change his ways, but he never does, and he goes back to his old gods every time. You know, he worships God, or he follows God, or obeys God when it's convenient, or when he has no other alternative, but the rest of the time completely rejects God, turns his back on him. But like we said here, with this, once again, this about face that he does, humbles himself, God shows him mercy, and spares him all of the judgment that is coming. And with that, the chapter ends off. So the question is, what do we learn from this story? Well, like we talked about last week, God is not only a God of mercy, but also a God of judgment. And we see that very clearly in here today. We see God's judgment come down on Ahab and all that he has done, and that God is going to kill it. You know, Ahab is going to have to die. He's going to be killed and all of his sons and all of his offspring, all trace of Ahab is going to be gone from the world. On top of that, we also see God is a God of mercy. We see God's justice come, but we also see his mercy because he says Ahab will not see all of that justice. All that judgment is coming, Ahab will not experience. Ahab himself will still die. He will still be punished, and we'll look at that next week. But he will not suffer all of the things. He will not see all of the things. I mean, it's hard enough for Ahab to realize that he is going to die, that he is going to be punished. But if he had to watch all of his children, all of his grandchildren, that would have been unbearable. So God does show him a small mercy to relent with that punishment. The judgment is still coming. Ahab himself will not experience it. So like I said, we see God is a God of mercy, but also a God of judgment. And we see them both here in this incident instance. Now there's one other thing that I want to talk about in here, and this is a follow-up to probably over a month ago when we were in 1 Kings chapter 19. Back then, if you remember, and it's been a while so you may have forgotten, but we talked about Elijah. It was Elijah after Mount Carmel when Jezebel was going to kill him, and he struggled, and he had a crisis. You know, probably a mental health crisis is what he experienced. And as we talked about in that sermon, we said there's a lot of scholars that condemn Elijah and say that God rejected Elijah, or Elijah and he replaced him with Elijah because that was part of that chapter, is that Elijah appointed Elisha as his successor. But as we talked about in that sermon, that wasn't the case. God did not reject Elijah. He was not condemning Elijah. He was not punishing Elijah. He was helping Elijah, providing for Elijah, and that God was not done with Elijah. He did not abandon Elijah because Elijah struggled. And we see this here today as the affirmation, because who is the main character in here with King Ahab? It is Elijah. God did not reject Elijah after Mount Carmel, and he had his crisis of the faith. God encouraged him, God helped him, God restored him, and God continued to use him. And that's an important reminder for us today as well. When we struggle, 
when we have doubt, when we have crisis of the faith, when we have mental health issues, God does not reject us. He doesn't say, oh, you failed me, you're done, I'm going to find someone else. God still loves us, cares for us, and still continues to use us and allow us to be part of his plan. And that's an encouragement for us. And that we see here today. And there will be more times that we're still going to see Elijah in his role for God. So it's a good reminder that God never rejects us or abandons us. He still continues to use us and cherish us. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for these lessons. And Lord, how they can apply to us today. Lord, encourage us and remind us, Lord, Lord, that you are a God of mercy and a God of judgment. And Lord, that you never abandon us or reject us, Lord. That you always care for us and you're always there with us and continue to use us. In your name we pray. Amen. So with that, thank you. I apologize. Today's video is going to be a little different, of course. Uh, but you know what? Even on Sunday, we didn't have a regular singing because we didn't have either of our penis either. So even when I recorded on Sunday, still wouldn't have the singing. So... I hope you enjoyed this message and we look forward to next Sunday and to be able to do a whole service on Sunday in our regular format for you guys. Have a great day.